Hello and welcome to Lesson 8 of 20 in the Ursa Campa Breakdown course on Introductory Statistics and Probability. This is Module 2, Probability, Part 2, Counting Principles. Let's get started. In this lesson, we look at fundamental rules for determining amounts that may otherwise be extremely difficult or even impossible to count directly. These counting principles are essential tools for calculating probabilities under various scenarios, which is the subject that will be explored further in later lessons in this module. The following topics are covered in this lesson. The multiplication principle, permutations, and combinations. We start with the multiplication principle, which is a simple but very fundamentally important principle that is applied throughout probability. And it goes like this. It basically says if you have a certain number of ways of performing uh, a certain task, and the, we can call the first task T1, and we can call the number of ways of doing that task big N1. And if we similarly have big N two ways of performing a second task, T2, and so on and so forth, up to big N subscript little n ways of performing the nth task, Tn, then the total number of ways to perform all of these N tasks in succession is simply the product of the number of ways of performing each individual task. So that just equals n1 times n2 times dot 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 all the way up to times n n. In example one, we've got a situation where hikers must travel across two rivers to get from their base camp to their day's final destination. Now for the first river, there are two different bridge crossings, a and b. And for the second river, there are three different bridge crossings available, I, double I, and triple I. So in part A, we're asked to calculate the number of different possible routes that each hiker can take to get from the base camp to the destination. And in part B, we are asked to show the full set of these routes in roster notation. So the answer below in the slide starts with a diagram and you can see the base camp on the left and the destination on the right. And in between there are the two rivers to cross and we see the two bridges over the first river, A and B, and the three bridges, I, double I, and triple I, over the second river. So to answer part A, we use the multiplication principle. The total number of routes will equal the number of possible crossings for the first river, which is two, times the number of possible crossings for the second river, which is three. So we end up with an answer of two times three, which equals six. For part B, we are supposed to list, we're being asked to list all these possible routes, and this question actually serves to confirm that the correct number is six, and it works as follows. We have, we start system, we proceed systematically, and the list goes, starts with all the possible routes if you choose bridge A for the first river crossing. So you can see there's three pro possibilities for that, AI, AII, and AIII. And then the same for if we chose bridge B instead for the first river, and then we get BI, BII, and BIII. In example two, we have a coin that's being tossed, and every time it's tossed or flipped, the outcome is either heads or tails. So you probably know this type of situation very well. So in this question, we're asked to do a few things. In part A, we're asked to calculate the number of different outcomes that are possible if uh, the coin is tossed twice and to list those outcomes. Part B asks us to redo this for three tosses of the coin instead of two. And then in part C, we're asked to generalize this for any number K tosses of the coin. So to answer this question, starting with part A, we can think of each of these coin tosses as being a separate task that has two different possible outcomes, heads or tails. And we use H for heads and T for tails. 
So the total number of outcomes for two coin tosses would therefore be using the multiplication principle two times two or two to the power two, which equals four. And we can list those outcomes. And because it's a fairly small number of outcomes, it doesn't take long to write them down and to see that that's an exhaustive list with no other possible um, outcomes. And so we end up with heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails being the possible outcomes. In part B, we extend the situation to there being three tosses. And so the answer, therefore, for the number of outcomes would simply become 2 times 2 times 2, which is 2 to the power of 3, which equals 8. And that's still a fairly small enough number that we can easily list uh, the full set of outcomes and we can satisfy ourselves that there are no no more no less number of outcomes so we see the possibilities are heads 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 tails heads tails heads tails heads 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 tails 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 heads tails 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 heads and tails 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 in part c we have to take a step back and look at this more in the general sense so if k equals the number of tosses of the coin, then what we have here are k separate identical tasks, each of which has two possible outcomes of heads or tails. So therefore, the logically, we can conclude that the number of outcomes would equal uh, 2 multiplied the number of times uh, equal to k. So we end up with an answer of 2 to the power of k. One important application of the multiplication principle is in working out the number of subsets of any finite set. In example three, we have a situation like this. Part A asks us to show all possible subsets for the set A equals the letters A, B, and C. And then in part B, we're asked to figure out how many different subsets there are in a set with K elements, which looks at a more general um, number of elements. And then in part C, we're to go back and use the formula we, we come up with in part B to confirm the, the answer that we got in part A for the number of subsets listed um, in part A. So the answers proceed as follows. Because the set A here only has uh, three elements, which is a relatively small number of elements, it's it's fairly easy to just list the possible subsets without doing really any sort of mathematical calculation. And we see that listed on the slide below. So we can see the possible subsets and we can do this in a systematic way, um, starting with um, the empty set. So the low extreme is that we can think of uh, the subset that includes uh, none of the elements in A, B, and C. And so that is the extreme um, case on the, on the small side, on the empty side. So we've got the empty set, and then we can proceed to list the sets that have just one of the elements. And of course, that would be either just A or just B or just C. And then we can proceed through the next largest size of subsets, which is that those that include two of the three elements. So that would be A and B, or A and C, or B and C. And then finally, the only other possible subset is the other extreme on the high end, and that is the full set of A and B and C. And again, notice that we include those two extreme cases, the empty set, uh, where none of the elements are present, and the set A itself, which is the subset with all of the elements present. In part B, we now take a look at this in a sort of a general case. So the situation here is actually the same as for the previous question about K coin tosses in a way that we can explain here. Because if you think about it, for any possible subset of the overall set, each element of the set has two possible states. Either they're in the subset or they're out of the subset. So for each element of the set, there's two possibilities. And then we repeat that sort of, we can call that sort of a task is determining uh, whether the item is in or out of the subset. We repeat that a total of K times, once for each element of the set. So in other words, as the diagram on the slide here shows, there's two possibilities for each element, either in or out. And we, using the multiplication principle, we multiply that for each of the K elements. So 
we get the conclusion that for a set with k elements, the number of subsets equals 2 to the power of k. So now to do part C, we go back to part A, and we can see that the number of elements in the set is 3. So using the formula that we just derived in part B, the number of subsets would equal 2 to the power of 3, which equals 8. And that confirms the result that we got from A when we did it not mathematically, but just by listing the um, elements that we, could, um, that we could think of. In example four, we're asked to figure out how many different overall outcomes are possible if a person flips a coin, then rolls a die, and then draws a card from a standard deck of cards. So these are all using, we assume here that we're using um, the sort of standard items that, that we would know of. For example, a coin with two sides and a die with six sides, and then a standard deck of cards, which has 52 different cards. So if we flip a coin, then roll a die, then draw a card in succession, the multiplication principle can be applied as follows. Since the number of coin that outcomes from the coin is 2 and 6 from the die and 52 from the deck, we simply multiply to get the answer. So we get 2 times 6 times 52, which equals 624 different outcomes. In example 5, we're asked to determine how many different postal codes are possible, depending on the format of the code. <clears throat> In part A, the format we're using is six consecutive digits. And in part B, we're asked to answer the question if the postal codes are made of sequences of letter, digit, letter, digit, letter, digit. So we start with um, part A. So the six digit postal code you can see on the slide looks like um, we use the symbol D to represent a digit. And uh, so we can see we have D, 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 D. And each of those digits can happen in 10 different ways. In other words, we have the digits from 0 to 9. So the number of possible postal codes would simply be 10 to the power of 6, which is 1 million. Now, in the second sequence in Part B, we're looking at the system where we have L for letter and D for digits. So it's L, D, L, D, L, D, which... Uh, if you uh, live in Canada or know about Canada and its mail system, you'll recognize that to be the postal code system used in Canada. Each digit can happen in 10 different ways, as we've already discussed. And each letter, assuming that we're using uh, our um, alphabet, that the, the alphabet that we commonly use uh, in, in the English language, it has 26 different letters from A to Z. So we have 26 different ways for each letter. So the number of codes, and we basically, we use the multiplication principle then in order, and we just go letter, letter, digit, letter, digit, letter, digit. So we get 26 times 10 times 26 times 10 times 26 times 10, which we can mathematically for the calculation, we can simplify that because we can rearrange uh, the order doesn't matter in multiplication. So we get 26 to the power 3 times 10 to the power 3, and that works out to be 17,576,000. And you can see that that is almost 18 times larger than the number of different postal codes in Part A. So you can probably get a sense of why the letters are used in the postal codes, that they significantly increase the number of um, unique codes that can be assigned. For some situations, it's much easier to find the number of elements in a set by first finding the number of elements in the complement of the set and then subtracting it from the number of elements in the universal set. In other words, the, we, we use the fact that the number of elements, you'll remember we discussed this previously, that the number of elements in the set A plus the number of elements in the set A complement has to equal the number of elements in the universal set. So therefore, we can rearrange that and, and say that the number of elements in any set A is equal to the number of elements in the universal set minus the number of elements in a complement. And you might be wondering why we would bother taking this um, equation and rearranging it. 
And the reason is that there are often situations where it's much easier to figure out the number of elements using this method of the complement. And we look at an example now with example six. So example six asks, how many different postal codes are possible if, if each postal code must contain at least one X or one seven? Now, if you think about this question, <clears throat> After a few seconds, it may occur to you, or it should occur to you, that this is actually quite a complicated question to, to ask if we try and figure out the answer using every possible combination. The difficulty with calculating this answer directly is that the possible postal codes could have, could have anywhere from 0 to 3 x's, as well as anywhere from 0 to 3 sevens with the only combination not permitted being the case where there are zero x's and zero sevens. In other words, there are no x's or nor any sevens. So <clears throat> what this actually results in is a situation where we have, there's four possibilities from zero to three x's, there's four different scenarios, and there's four scenarios, zero to three sevens. So that's 16. Uh, minus the case where the one case we're not allowed to have, which is where we have zero, both zero of x's and sevens. So we actually have 16 minus one or 15 different scenarios to consider. So, and we would, what we would need to do for each of those scenarios, we would, we would also <clears throat> need to consider how the x's and non x's are arranged. And then we would need to do the same for the sevens and non sevens. So what that actually means is we would have a very complex solution to work out if we proceeded in this way. Now, it's not impossible to find the answer this way, but if you were to try to do this way, you would see it would be extremely time consuming. So if we can find a much more efficient, efficient solution, we'd like to, to go after that. So if we consider the opposite case, where there are simply no x's and no sevens, and then the num the, if we were to figure that out, then the number of possible codes under this restriction, in other words, the answer to the question, could be calculated in just one step, which is to simply subtract that number from the universal set of all possible codes with no restrictions. In other words, we would figure out the restricted case and subtract it from the overall case, which is the universal set. And we've already done that in the previous example. So if we let u equal the set of all postal codes with no restrictions, and this is the uh, letter, digit, letter, digit, letter, digit that we did in part B of the previous example. And uh, we let the set A be the set of all postal codes with at least one X or one seven. So A is the set that we're interested in. So the answer to the question that we're looking for, which is the number of elements in set A, would equal the number of elements in the universal set U minus the number of elements in A complement, where A complement is that restricted set of all codes that have no X's nor sevens. So you can see that from the last question, uh, the answer for the number of elements in the set U is 26 to the power 3 times 10 to the power 3, which is 17,576,000. And then the, the number of sets, the number of elements in a complement is not that hard to figure out because all we do, as you can see in the diagram, is if we can't have any X's, then we're just reducing the total number of available letters from 26 to 25. And similarly, if we're not allowed to have a seven anywhere in the code, then we remove one of the 10 digits and then now the number of digits drops to nine. So what we end up with is 26 to the power three times 10 to the power three, that's the universal set, minus 25 to the power three times nine to the power three. And 25 to the power of 3 minus 9 to the power of 3 is 11,390,625. So when we subtract that from 17,576,000, we get our answer of 6,185,375. Now notice, th this is a really large number. And now we're getting into the um, types of questions that really all of this um, mathematics is being designed to serve. Uh, that we're really starting to see the purpose here. Six million, more than six million is not something we can actually physically count. We certainly can't list all the possible codes here. We wouldn't have enough time to do that. 
by any stretch of the imagination. So we're using methods here that sort of does the counting without counting, so to speak. Next, we talk about permutations. A permutation is an arrangement of a finite set of objects in a specific order. So order matters. That's really important whenever we're talking about permutations. In example seven, we have three letters, A, B, and C, and the, the number of permutations of those three letters is as follows. So they can be arranged in the following different ways. Now, because the number of letters we're looking at here is fairly small, we can just take a non-mathematical approach and just think about what the different arrangements are. And we come up with um, the six different permutations that you see on the slide. ABC, ACB, BAC, BCA, CAB, and CBA. And if you were to uh, take a little bit of time to verify this, you would see in short order that there are uh, no more and no less possible permutations than those six. Now, to see why mathematically the number of permutations equals six, we can use what's called a tree diagram. And the diagram you see on the slide here is a tree diagram. And it starts on the left, and it starts from a single point, and you see that the branches radiate out from that single point. And what we have here is we have three stages in this tree diagram. The first stage is the uh, selection of the first letter, and then so we have A, B, and C. And then from each of those, A, B, and C, they become a starting point for the next stage, which continues. So the tree sort of continues to the right. And, uh, and that's why we call it a tree. It's kind of a, if you turn your um, head to the right, you can sort of see this as sort of a tree. It's a sort of a sideways tree. So radiating from each of the A, B, and C from the first letter selection, we have the possibility of the second letter. Now you'll notice that for the second letter, the number of choices is now reduced because we can't repeat the letters. We're actually arranging three different letters here. So once you've chosen one letter for the first letter, you only have, uh, you have one less letter for the next selection. So from three choices, we get down to two choices. So you can see um, that for the second stage, which is the selection of the second letter, from each point from the first letter stage, we only have two choices. And then once the second letter has been chosen, so you can see, for example, when the first letter is A, the second letter can either be B or C. For the third letter, though, you'll see there's only one choice because once we've chosen the first two letters, our third letter, we're limited to only the letter that remains. So there's only one choice for the third letter. So it continues to drop by one. So you can see, for example, that if the first letter chosen is A and the second letter chosen is B, then we must use C for the third letter, and so on and so forth for the rest of the branches on the tree. And then the, in green, you see the final outcomes. That just shows the resulting string that we get as you follow each of those branches on the tree. So we end up with the number of arrangements simply being the number of choices for the first letter times the number of choices for the second letter times the number of choices for the third letter, and that equals three times two times one, which equals six. In example eight, we're asked to find how many different ways five people can arrange themselves along a bench. So to answer this question, we have to consider first that with five people, uh, a tree diagram is going to start to be you know, quite a bit complex. I mean, you could certainly do it, but um, as we saw in the previous slide with uh, three stages in a tree diagram, the, the tree starts to get pretty large and imagine two more stages. So while we could draw a tree diagram, this is probably a good point at, at which we can start to simply extend the idea uh, from that sort of a tree diagram. If we can understand the multiplication pattern that we got last time, which was three times two times one, then we should be able to come up with an answer uh, in a fairly reasonable manner. So here's the, here's the overall process here. We've got five people to choose from for the first place on the bench. And then for the next place on the bench, there'll be four and then three, et cetera, all the way down to one. So clearly uh, the, the number of arrangements can be uh, worked out similar to the last question. And it would just be five times four times three times two times one. And we don't really need a tree diagram for that. So the answer works out to be 120. In general, 
the number of permutations of n distinct objects is equal to, and so now we're sort of taking a step back and looking at this more generally. So you can see we're using the same sort of diagram here with the boxes. So for the first um, box, we have it, we can choose from all n of the objects, and then each successive choice has one less. So it becomes n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, and so on and so forth. So you see the times dot, 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 and then times 3 times 2 times 1. So that's a general way of representing that. Now there's a um, terminology that's commonly used for, for this, which is called n factorial. So it's the n with the exclamation mark pronounced n factorial. And the rule for n factorial is as follows. 1 factorial equals 1 and 2 factorial equals 2 times 1, which equals 2, and 3 factorial equals 3 times 2 times 1, which works out to be 6, and hopefully by now you can see the pattern. 4 factorial equals 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which works out to be 24, etc. Now there's one special definition that we need to include as well because it comes up in a lot of the formulas that we use, and that is 0 factorial. Now, it would it, you might think um, at first thought that zero factorial would equal zero and that it would that is definitely a common misconception but the definition of zero factorial is actually that it equals one and we'll see why that makes sense as we start using factorials so to summarize we can define n factorial as being either the special case of one when n is zero or for all numbers from one and higher so these are um, whole numbers um, actually the natural set of numbers, which are the whole numbers or the positive integers from 1 uh, and upwards, the formula for n factorial is defined as above, as n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, etc., etc., times 3 times 2 times 1. In example 9, we're asked in how many different ways can three of the five people from the previous example arrange themselves along a bench with three seats? So this question is similar to the last few questions, but there is a bit of a difference. In this question, we've got more people than seats. So if we model this problem as just the three boxes, we can see that we have five people to choose from to put into the first seat and then we have four left and then three left and then we stop there we don't keep multiplying all the way down to one so the answer to this question is that the number of arrangements would be five times four times three which equals 60. now the answer to the previous example could also be written as follows and we we came up with the answer five times four times three but notice that we could write that as five times four times three times two times one divided by 2 times 1. Now the reason we could do that is because the 2 times 1's would cancel from the top and bottom. Now why would we even do that? Well, the point here is that if we did write it that way, then the top would actually be 5 factorial, based on the definition we just gave for factorial, and the bottom would be 2 factorial. So the answer to this question would be 5 factorial over 2 factorial, which equals 5 factorial divided by the factorial of 5 minus 3. And notice that the 5 is the total number of objects, and 3 is the number of them that we want to arrange. So that gives us a general rule. And the, that rule is that the number of permutations of n distinct objects taken r at a time is written as npr, which we call n permute r, so NPR equals N factorial divided by N minus R factorial. And we also add the condition that R must be less than or equal to N because you, um, you, can, you can't arrange or you can't permute more objects than you have. And there'll be a little bit more about that in a moment. Now notice two special, the following two special cases of the formula that we just derived. And that is that NPN uh, is equal to, according to the formula, it equals N factorial over N minus N factorial, which gives us N factorial over zero factorial. Now remember, we needed a rule for this, and this is one of the reasons that we needed the rule for zero factorial. So zero factorial being defined as one means that NPN just works out to be N factorial over one. And so NPN equals N factorial. 
In other words, if you take all of your n objects and arrange them all, then the number of permutations simply equals n factorial. The other special case is if you have n p0. Now, using it, if you use if we use the formula that we just established, we would get n factorial over n minus 0 factorial, which would give us n factorial over n factorial, which equals 1. And the reason that the answer for any number n p0, or permute 0, is equal to 1 is that there's only one way to arrange nothing. It's just the empty set. So there's only one empty set possible. Another further rule worth mentioning is that NPR equals zero if R is greater than N. So you'll recall in the previous slide that when we established the rule for NPR, we saw that there was this condition that R had to be less than or equal to N. So what happens if R is greater than N? Well, the answer is that the number of permutations is always zero. So for instance, in the previous example, 5P6 would, would mean that we're trying to take five people and arrange them uh, into six seats. Um, that's impossible because we don't have enough people to fill those seats. It's in, in other words, it's impossible to arrange more objects than are available in the overall set. In example 10, we can now calculate all possible permutations of five people along a row of seats, and we can take r equals 0 through r equals 5 to look at all of the possible uh, values of r that can be used with n equals 5. So you can see in the slide here, we are going to generate an answer for all the values from 0 through 5. And using the notation that we just defined, we can see that the number of permutations will be 5p0, 5p1, 5p2, right through to 5p5. And using the formula, we get the answers that the number of ways of uh, permuting uh, 0 of the 5 people is 1. And the number of ways of permuting one of them equals to 5. And then 5 5p2 gives us 20, 5p3 gives us 60, 5p4 gives us 120, and 5p5 equals 120 as well. Now, and that's all using the formula that we just derived um, a moment ago. Now, there's a few interesting general properties that, that we can clearly see that are well illustrated by this example, and they're noted here in blue. Notice, first of all, that NP0 always equals 1 for all n, as we previously discussed. And below it is another um, interesting property, and that is that for any number n, NP1 will always equal n. So in other words, the number of ways of arranging one person from the 5 is just going to equal 5, because it's just five different people to choose from. And then at the bottom of the page, we can see that there is a similarity between, notice how 5p4 and 5p5 are the same. And an interesting rule that comes out of that is that npn-1 will always equal to npn for all values n. And the reason for that is when we choose the, in this particular example, the number of ways of arranging four people on a bench is 120, which is quite a lot, quite a large number of ways. And notice that for each of those arrangements, there'll always be the person who was left out. So to make an arrangement of five, you would simply take that person and just add them on to the end of the existing arrangement. So there would be the same number of arrangements. And that's why the answer for 5p4 equals 5p5. In example 11, we're asked to figure out how many different ways five people can be seated around a round table. So the big difference in this question is that we're no longer looking at a linear table. Um, and now the, the people are seated in a circle. Now, along a linear table, the number of different permutations is equal to 5 factorial. And we've established that uh, in the previous examples. 
However, while a linear table has a definite start and end position, so there's start and end positions, um, whether you're starting on the left and ending on the right or vice versa, once you decide which way you're going to go, you've definitely got a distinct starting place and an ending place. A circular table, on the other hand, does not. So what this means is that the same arrangement of seats can appear to be different even if they're just merely rotated. And the picture on the slide here shows an example. So we've got two diagrams. And uh, you can see on the left, we've got uh, uh, overhead view of the table. And if we use letters to represent the people, we've got going clockwise from the top, we've got A, B, C, D, E. Now the diagram on the right, if we go clockwise from the top, it seems different. It's E, A, B, C, D. But if you actually just go and start on A and go clockwise from A, you'll see that it's actually the same. It's A, B, C, D, E. So while the entire picture of the table has been rotated, in this case clockwise by one position, um, it doesn't actually make a different arrangement. It's the exact same uh, seating arrangement. So we need to um, we need to reconcile this. We need to um, we need to deal with that fact. And it definitely suggests at this point that there might be fewer, that there will be fewer um, uh, no, different number of arrangements in this particular case compared to the linear table. So the solution to the to this problem is to fix one of the people in place. Um, and by fix, we mean conceptually fix. So if we just sort of pick a person and make them sort of a, a fixed point, then we can arrange the remaining people about them or around them. So if you look at the diagram, you can see what we've done here is that we, we can choose we can choose any of the people, but if, in here we've chosen A. And so if we fix uh, that person A in place and ask ourselves the question, how many different ways could we arrange the other people around them, we can see that even though it's curved, it's still got a start and an end. In other words, it's no different than a linear table or bench. So what we end up with is we have four um, different people who are to be arranged about A. And of course, since there's a definite start and end point, we treat it the same as we did before. So the answer must equal four, factor four factorial, which equals 24. Now notice the answer is not five factorial, but four factorial, because we by choosing one of the people to fix the others around, we're actually taking them out of the equation. So we can generalize that to get the rule that the number of arrangements of n objects in a circle equals n minus 1 factorial. So far, we've looked at examples where all objects are distinct from one another. In, in other cases, though, some objects are not distinct from others. In example 12, we're asked to figure out how many different six-letter strings can be made from each of the following. So part A, we have the uh, word France, and in part B, we have Canada. In part C, we have banana, and in part D, we have boo-boo. So the answers to this question are as follows. In part A, we see that the letters in France are six different letters. So the number of different arrangements we, we calculate as we did before. We would just go six factorial and the answer is 720. In part B, we're looking at the word Canada. Now, Canada has six letters, but they're not six all different letters. We have three letters, three A's, and they're the same. And then we have three other letters, C, N, and D. So, what happens here is that for any of the overall six factorial arrangements of these letters, we can see in the diagram, for example, if we use the arrangement Canada, um, which is one arrangement of these letters, uh, we can see that we, if we look at those three A's, we could arrange those A's amongst themselves in three factorial ways, and that would not make any new strings. So there are three factorial ways to arrange that overall arrangement of six letters that would make no change in the actual string that we get. So what we do is we divide the overall number of arrangements, which is six factorial, by that three factorial number of ways that we would arrange the identical letters. 
So the answer becomes 6 factorial divided by 3 factorial, which cancels out to give 6 times 5 times 4, which gives us a final answer of 120. Now, you could satisfy yourself by sitting down and doing all of the arrangements of the word Canada, and you're probably starting to realize that the numbers are getting quite big. And that's why we it's, it's critical that we come up with um, um, exact, efficient, powerful techniques for determining these numbers. Um, in other words, these counting techniques are now becoming really important because they replace the actual physical process of counting in a sort of eeny, meeny, miny, mo way. So we can generalize. If a set of n objects is made up of n1 identical objects of one kind and n2 identical objects of another kind and so on and so forth, right on up to nk identical objects of yet another kind, such that n1 plus n2 plus dot 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 plus nk equals the total number of n, then the number of permutations of these objects taken n at a time is equal to n factorial divided by the product of the individual factorials. So for France, we can actually apply this rule to all of the all of the um, examples in this question. So for France, we've actually got we don't actually have any letters that are repeated, but we can think of uh, each letter having a number of one occurrence. So we have NF, NR, etc., all the way up to the to the letter E, so the NE. They're all equal to one because each letter occurs one time. So technically, we can use this formula, and the number of arrangements will just equal six factorial divided by the product of all those one factorials, which is just one factorial six times. But of course, one factorial is one, and one to any power equals one. So all we're doing is we're dividing six factorial by one. And of course, anytime you divide any number by one, um, you get you get itself. Any number divided by 1 equals itself, so the answer to this question is 6 factorial, which is 720. No surprise there. Now, this rule becomes useful when we start looking at an example where we do have repetition of letters. So for Canada, uh, NC, NN, and ND are all equal to 1, but NA equals 3. That's the repeated letter. So the number of arrangements equals 6 factorial over 1 factorial times 1 factorial times 1 factorial times 3 factorial. Now you can see what we'll generally do henceforth is that we don't need to show the 1 factorial. So we just show on the bottom <clears throat> the numbers that actually do something to the division. So we can more efficiently show this as 6 factorial divided by 3 factorial. And that works out to be our 6 times 5 times 4, which equals 120. We can now use this equation to um, find a very direct solution, very uh, straightforward and quick solution to the last two questions. So the word banana, so part C, the word is banana and we, we have three A's and two N's. So we have two different letters that are repeated. So the answer to this question then is just equal to six factorial divided by three factorial, two factorial. And that works out to be six times five times four divided by two, <clears throat> which all works out to be 60. And then finally in part D, we see the word boo-boo. It has four O's and two B's. So we've got all the letters that are in that word. There's actually only two unique letters and they're all, they're both repeated. And so the number of arrangements equals six factorial divided by four factorial and two factorial. And that works out to be 15. And notice how the number of arrangements gets smaller, generally speaking, as the number of uh, repeated letters increases. Next, we look at combinations. Now, so far, we've only looked at situations where order is important, such as in the arrangements of people along a bench or letters in a word or string. Now, when order is not important, which is often the case, the selection of objects is called a combination, and the number of different possibilities is reduced significantly compared with a similar size permutation. So the key idea with combinations is that order does not matter, as opposed to permutations where order matters. So for combinations, the, 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 the general idea is that order does not matter. 
Now, in example 13, we're asked to figure out how many different ways a committee of three people can be chosen from a group of eight candidates. If, and then we see the two um, situations in part A, the committee is to be made up of a president, a treasurer, and a secretary. And in part B, the committee is to be made up of three equal ranking positions. So to answer this question, we start with part A. In, in part A, the three, we see that the three positions are distinct from each other, which means that it's a permutation. And so we can set this up using the boxes as we've done before, but you see the order would still matter here because um, imagine if you're one of these people and you're chosen, there's going to be a difference between whether you're the president or the treasurer or secretary. Your job, your job will be different depending on which of those boxes that you're, you're put into. So part A is actually a permutation question. And so we've got eight people and we're choosing three people and uh, putting them into distinct positions. So this is, the answer to this question is that the number of different committees will be 8P3, which works out to be 8 factorial over 8 minus 3 factorial, which is 8 factorial over 5 factorial, which works out to be 8 times 7 times 6, and that equals 336 different possible committees. In part B, the three committee positions are not distinct from each other. So for any particular combination of three people selected for the committee, the three factorial different ways they can be arranged um, gives you a, essentially an identical committee. So in order to adjust for this overcounting, we simply divide the number of permutations by the number of arrangements to get the correct answer. So uh, in other words, the, the correct answer here for the number of committees is we take the 8P3 and which is the number of ways of choosing them into distinct positions and we divide by the three factorial ways of arranging those because they actually aren't distinct. And what that gives us is we get uh, 8 factorial over 8 minus 3 factorial, which is 8 factorial over 5 factorial, divided by 3 factorial, <clears throat> and mathematically that works out to be 8 factorial over 5 factorial, 3 factorial, which cancels out and works out to be 56. Now, in general, the, the rule for this is that the number of combinations of n distinct objects taken r at a time is written as ncr, which is pronounced n choose r, and this equals n factorial over r factorial times n minus r factorial with the same condition uh, from before with the permutations that R must be less than or equal to N, simply meaning again that you cannot um, choose more than is available. Now, one thing to point out here is that notice that the two numbers being factorialized in the denominator, uh, R and N minus R, if you add those together, they always add up to N. And that's a very important property of combinations. And you can see in the example above here, uh, when, we, when we calculate the number of committees in this particular question where, we, where we're um, choosing three from eight, um, notice how we have eight factorial on top. And on the bottom, we have five factorial times three factorial. And notice how five plus three equals eight. So in example 14, we list all of the possible combinations from a set of five distinct elements. So we've got five choose zero, five choose one, all the way through to five choose five. And using the formula that we just developed, the answers that we get are one, five, 10, 10, five, and one. And there's an obvious pattern here. The numbers, notice how the, the values start at one, they increase, and then they decrease back to one, and there's a symmetry. Notice that five. Uh, notice that the, we have five choose zero and five choose five, both equaling one. And then we have five choose one and five choose four, both equaling five. And then five choose two and five choose three, both equal ten. So there's some interesting, and then there's there's very specific reasons why this is happening. So there are several important properties of combinations that we should mention here uh, that we saw in the preceding um, example. 
So firstly, in general, n choose r always equals n choose n minus r. And the reason for that is when you choose r objects from n objects, you're also at the same time choosing a complementary set of n minus r objects, n minus r objects that are not being chosen. So for example, if you're um, choosing two objects from five and you imagine you choose the two and you put them off to one side, you've got a group of two, but you leave behind a group of three. So there'll be an equal number um, of groups of size two and groups of size three. And that's why five choose two equals five choose three. So that gives us this general rule. Um, similarly, um, or another important rule here is, uh, and it's just a special case of that, this last rule we talked about, and that is n choose zero always equals n choose n, and they both equal one. And that's simply because there's only one way to choose no items from a set. You just don't choose anything. And there's also only one way to choose everything. You just choose the whole, the whole set. Uh, the, the third rule <clears throat> is um, also a special um, case from the first rule, and that is that n choose 1 always equals n choose n minus 1. And they always equal n. And, and the reason for that is whenever you're just choosing one object, the, there's always um, the answer for that is always that there's n ways to do that. So like if we're choosing um, one from five, of course, there's five ways to do that, which is why there's the same number of five ways of choosing four. Because when you choose four, you're just leaving one behind and there's five ways to do that. And then finally, we have a rule, the rule that says that n choose r will equal zero if r is greater than n. And that's the same as the rule, similar to the rule we saw for permutations. Um, because it's impossible to choose more than is available. So for example, five choose six would equal zero. Now one further uh, interesting rule that we that arises here is that if you look at the previous example and add up all of the uh, combinations um, from five choose zero through five choose five, you would get one plus five plus 10 plus 10 plus 5 plus 1, and that actually equals 32. Now, 32 just so happens to equal 2 to the power 5. And in general, we have the rule below that says that if we add up n choose r for all the values of r from 0 to n, it will always equal to 2 to the power of n. So in this particular example, n is 5, which is why we get 2 to the power of 5 or 32. And the reason for this shouldn't surprise us because as we talked about earlier on, each of the n elements of the set can either be selected or not. So we have this in or out rule being raised to the power of the number of elements, which is n. So we end up with 2 to the power of n. In example 15, we take a look at Lotto 649 which is a, a well-known lottery in Canada. And the way that Lotto 649 works is each ticket is based on select, a selection of six numbers from the numbers one through 49. So the question we'll look at here is to figure out how many different tickets are possible if the order of selection does not matter. Now, if you know, if you've ever seen how this lottery is drawn, they have a big machine that's got a 49 balls in it and they're numbered 1 through 49 and when you pick your numbers if you if you um, if you're playing this game uh, and I don't recommend that people um, not necessarily recommending that people uh, gamble do any sort of gambling involving paying money but um, if you are playing this game what you would do or a game like it is that you would simply pick any six numbers out of 49 and um, the 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 reason that order doesn't matter is because when the winning numbers are selected, they don't necessarily come out. What happens is they spin the ball, the machine with the balls, and then six of the balls randomly come out. Uh, and uh, the order isn't necessarily in, in increasing order, and it actually doesn't matter. So because it, the order that the numbers are drawn out of the machine doesn't matter, we can say that this is a, a combination type question as opposed to a permutation type question. So to answer the question about how many different tickets are possible, um, we, we simply 
need to realize that this is a combination of 6 from 49. So we're essentially the number of different tickets is simply equal to 49 choose 6. And using the formula for combinations, that equals 49 factorial over 6 factorial, 43 factorial. And the answer we get is 13,983,816. In example 16, we're looking at an orchestra. We've got an orchestra with 12 violinists in it. And the conductor wish, would like to divide them into three um, sections, the first violin, second violin, and third violin sections. And the sizes of those sections are 6, 4, and 2, respectively. Now, if the order within each section does not matter, then in how many different ways can the conductor assign the violinist to the different groups? Now, if you know anything about um, orchestras and, and first, second, third violin, etc., it's that it, it, what matters is what section you're in because you'll get different music um, that you're supposed to play. You'll play a different part to the song. Whereas within a group, it doesn't matter where, where you're sitting. If you're, say, a third violinist, it doesn't matter where you're sitting among there. You all have the same sheet music and the same part to play. So that's what's meant here by order. It doesn't matter. So to figure out how we would answer this question, we can look at it as a series of three consecutive tasks that the conductor has to complete. So first, the conductor has to choose the six violinists uh, out of the 12 to be in the first section, first violin section, and then uh, choose four for the second violin group, and then choose two for the third violin group. So we can use the multiplication principle, and it's illustrated here on the slide. We've got three boxes, and in each box we've got a calculation for um, what for the number of ways of doing each of those tasks. So we can see that the number of ways of selecting the first violins would be 12 choose 6. Now for the second uh, task, to, the conductor has to choose four violin violinists for the second violin group, but the conductor's already chosen six in the first step. So there's only 12 minus 6, which is 6. There's only six violinists left to choose from. So the calculation for the second box is 6 choose 4. And um, really, the third task doesn't even need to be done, because if you think about it, by choosing six first violinists and then four second violinists, that leaves the remaining two violinists who must be the third violinist. So the answer to the question is 12 choose 6 times 6 choose 4 times 2 choose 2. And uh, of course, 2 choose 2 just equals 1. But we can see the mathematics here. If we just sort of use the formula for combinations on all three and do the calculation as we go, we see that, interestingly enough, we end up with 12 factorial over 6 factorial, 4 factorial, 2 factorial, works out, which works out to be 13,860. So note, the above calculation is based upon the first violinist being chosen first, followed by the second violins, leaving the remaining players as third violins. It's left to the reader to verify that the answer is the same regardless of the order in which the violin groups are selected. In fact, if you look carefully at the final calculation, which is 12 factorial over 6 factorial, 4 factorial, 2 factorial, you'll see as well that this, is, this answer is calculated exactly the same way that you would have figured out the number of strings. And now, I don't mean violin strings, but actually like letter strings of, of a word um, or containing 12 um, letters in which six were identical of one kind and four were, were identical of another kind and two were identical of a third kind. So we can see this is an, uh, an excellent example uh, and one of many where uh, questions that appear to be of a very different nature can actually be worked out mathematically um, the same way. The following is a set of practice questions meant to provide a review of the material covered in this lesson. Question one, how many different three digit numbers are there? And there are three scenarios. A, if there are no restrictions. B, if the first digit cannot be zero. And C, if the three digits are not all the same. 
For part A, if there are no restrictions, then this is simply just a matter of we have 10 possible values, 0 through 9, for each digit, and there are three digits in a row. So the number of different numbers simply equals 10 times 10 times 10, or 10 to the power of 3, which equals 1,000. For part B, the only modification we need to make is to the first digit. Since the first digit cannot be 0, then instead of 10 choices, we have 9 choices for that first digit while the latter two digits remain unrestricted with the full 10 choices. So therefore, the number of different numbers is equal to 9 times 10 times 10, or 9 times 10 squared, which equals 900. And finally, for part C, if the three digits are not all the same, then there's two different scenarios we need to consider here. One would be the case where all the digits are different, and the other is the case where two digits are the same and one is different. However, there's another more efficient way we can do this. If we look at the scenario where all three digits are the same, that's relatively simpler to calculate, and it happens to represent the complement of what we're trying to find, which is the number of numbers where the three digits are not all the same. So if we can first calculate the number of ways to have a number here where all the three digits are the same, then we just need to subtract it from the total number of possible three-digit numbers with no restrictions, which we already did in part A, and then we get our answer. So that's what we'll do here. So if all three digits are the same, the number of different numbers that gives us is, and we can, we can work this out with a simple three box diagram here. For the first digit, we have our choice of all 10 digits from zero to nine. And then, but once we've committed to a particular digit from the first, uh, from the first digit, once we committed to one particular digit in the first space, that locks us in to using the same one for the other two. So then our choice is reduced to one for the second and the third digits. So the answer ends up being 10 times one times one, which equals 10. So finally, using the rule for the, the complement that we, that we were discussing previously, the final answer for the number of numbers where the three digits are not all the same equals the number with no restrictions, which is the 1,000 that we calculated in part A, minus the number with three digits all the same, which is the 10 that we just calculated here, which gives us our final answer of 990. Question two, a postal code system uses the format LDLDL, where L equals any letter in the alphabet and D equals any digit from zero through nine. How many such unique codes are possible under the following situations, A, with no restrictions, and B, if each code must be a palindrome, in other words, a string that reads the same forwards and backwards. For example, A1B1A is a palindrome because the string in reverse is also A1B1A. For part A, if there are no restrictions, then as we've seen previously in the example in this lesson, there are 26 possible values for each letter and 10 possible values for each digit. Therefore, the number of different codes equals 26 to the power 3 times 10 to the power 2, which is 17,576 times 100, which equals 1,000,000. 757,600. For part B, if the code must be a palindrome, then we proceed as follows. We have 26 choice, and there's a diagram on the bottom of the slide here that shows how we fill in these, how we can fill in these characters in terms of the number of choices for each. So each character is represented by a box, and we can see inside the number representing um, the number of choices. So we start with the, the first character 
which is a letter, and we have 26 choices for that. So in other words, there's no restrictions yet. And similarly, for the second character, which is the first digit we see, we have 10 choices at this point. So there's no restrictions as well there. So we have 26 times 10. However, once these first letter and first digit characters are selected, that, that fixes the, val the, the values that we can choose. That limits the, val the, the letter and the digit we can choose for the last character and second last character respectively. So those choices reduce down to just one. In other words, whatever, whatever letter and whatever digit we picked for the first two boxes. So those last two only have one choices each. And all that's left is the middle character. Now, there's five characters here, which is an odd number, which is, which is why there's a middle character here. And whenever there is an odd number of characters, when we're thinking about a palindrome, when we're looking at building a palindrome, there's no matching character for that middle character. So there will, there will be an unlimited, unrestricted, generally speaking, number of choices. So since it's a letter, we have 26 choices. So we put 26 into that middle box. So we end up with the number of different codes equaling 26 times 10 times 26 times 1 times 1, which equals 26 to the power 2 times 10, which equals 6,760. Question 3. Calculate the number of different words or strings that can be formed using all of the letters of the following words. In A, the word is lesser, L-E-S-S-E-R. In B, the word is bigger, B-I-G-G-E-R. And in C, the word is Mississippi, M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. -S -S so the way that we proceed with each of these uh, words is we do the permutation taking into account repeated letters as we did previously in the examples in the lesson. And in each case, the, the permutation will equal the, to, the factorial of the total number of letters divided by, for each repeated letter, the factorial of the number of times that letter is repeated. So for A, we have the word lesser. Uh, there are six letters in total with two E's and two R's. So the number of arrangements is 6 factorial over 2 factorial, 2 factorial, which equals 180. In B, the word is bigger. Again, 6 letters in total. This time, there's just one repeated letter, G. There's two Gs, so the number of arrangements is 6 factorial over 2 factorial, which equals 360. And finally, with Mississippi, we have 11 letters in total. There are four I's, four S's, and two P's, so the number of arrangements equals 11 factorial over 4 factorial, 4 factorial, 2 factorial, which equals 34,650. Question 4. A farmer is planning for the coming spring. There are a total of 10 crops, 4 grain, and 6 vegetable that the farmer can choose from but only three crops are to be planted. In how many ways can the farmer select the crops under the following situations? For A, if there are no restrictions. B, if there are exactly one grain and two vegetable crops that are selected. C, if there's at least one grain crop that must be selected. And D, if two of the vegetable crops, lettuce and spinach, must not both be selected. So the first thing we see here is that we are selecting crops from uh, available ones, and there's no reference to any arranging of the crops that are selected. So order doesn't matter. So for all of the parts of this problem, we, we, we use combinations, that these are combinations problems. 
For part A, there are no restrictions. And what that means is there's no relevant distinction between grain and vegetable in this part. So we can just consider that we have a total of four plus six equals 10 crops, of which we're choosing three. So the number of ways the farmer can select the crops without restrictions equals simply 10 choose three, which equals 120. For part B, now we distinguish between grain and vegetable crops. So we separate this into two parts and, and we multiply two combinations with each other. So the number of ways of selecting one grain crop from four is four choose one. And similarly, two vegetable crops from six is six choose two. And we multiply those. Four choose one times six choose two equals four times 15, which equals 60. For part C, the restriction is that one at least one grain crop must be selected now this given that we're selecting three crops in total and there are four grain cr crops in total to choose from we could end up having anywhere from one of the four all the way up to uh, three of the four. In other words, all three selected crops could be grain crops. And that satisfies the condition that there's at least one grain crop. So that would be three separate scenarios that we would have to consider and then work out and then add. We could do it this way, but that would be more complicated than the more simpler way of using the, the, the complement idea, which is that as we discussed in uh, previously uh, in the lesson uh, in in a case like this it would be much easier to simply look at what the opposite of at least one grain crop being selected is which is a very simple thing which is just zero grain crops which which really involves just one calculation so if we can calculate the number of ways that there are no grain crops we can then just subtract that from the no restrictions amount, which we already calculated in part A, and get our answer. So that's what we do. So if there are no grains, that means that we're not choosing anything from the uh, four available grain crops. So all we're really doing is just choosing three from three crops from the six other crops, the six vegetable crops. And that becomes our number of ways of getting no grains. So the answer to this question becomes the total number of ways without restrictions, which is the 120 we previously calculated, minus 6 choose 3, which equals 120 minus 20, which equals 100. For part D, we're looking for the number of ways where lettuce and spinach are not both selected. Now, Similar to part C, there's a multitude of ways that this can happen. One way is that lettuce is selected but not spinach, or spinach is selected but not lettuce, or neither lettuce nor spinach are selected. So there's three different scenarios we would need to work out separately and then add to get the final answer. But like part C, we can see here that what we're looking for which is lettuce and spinach not both selected, is simply the complement of lettuce and spinach both being selected. So we proceed the same way we did in part C by figuring out the number of ways that lettuce and spinach can both be selected and simply subtracting that from the number of ways with no restrictions. So to figure out the number of ways that lettuce and spinach are both selected, we we divide the, the total of 10 crops, not into grains and vegetables like we did before, but all we're interested in here is that we have the lettuce and spinach forming a group of two and everything else forming a group of eight, the other eight crops. So since both lettuce and spinach must both be selected, that would be two choose two. And then from the other eight, we need one more crop so that's eight choose one. So we get our answer for the number of ways of lettuce and spinach not both selected equals the number of ways of no restrictions, which is 120 as calculated in part A, 
minus the number of ways that lettuce and spinach are both selected, which is 2 choose 2 times 8 choose 1. That gives us 120 minus 1 times 8, or 120 minus 8, which equals 112. Question 5. How many different three-letter words can be formed from the letters in Canada? The answer to this problem is more complex than in the previous problems, because here the number of different letters among the three letters selected can vary based upon how many A's are included. Remember, there are, is a repetition. There are three identical A's in the word Canada. There are four different scenarios regarding this based on whether you have anywhere from zero A's through three A's in the, in the word or string. And we must calculate the number of arrangements for each scenario and then add them together to get the final answer, the total number of possible three-letter words. The way that we calculate the number of arrangements for each scenario is a two-step process. First, we need to calculate the number of ways of choosing the non-A's from the three non-A's, which are the C, the N, and the D. That's a combination. And then once we've done that, and then we essentially know our letters then, because if there are any more letters in that arrangement, depending on how many non-A's have been selected, the rest will be, if any, will be A's. We now have all our letters that we're gonna use and, and in, each, in each of the combinations, and then we have to arrange those. So uh, in, this, in this problem, we're arranging the letters. So these are strings or words. So we need uh, order matters. So we have, to, we have to multiply the result from the first step, the, the combination, with the permutation of the letters that we have. And for that, we have to take into account any repetition of letters, which in this case would be repetition of A's, if there are any, depending on the case. And we do this as we did it previously in this lesson, where we were looking at strings with repeated letters. And then we multiply the combination by the permutation to get the number of arrangements for each scenario. So in the first scenario, if we have zero A's, that means that all three of the letters in the string are non-A's, and there are three to choose from, the C, the N, and the D. So that would be three choose three. And then we have to arrange those. Now they'll all be different letters in this case. So the permutation for that would be three factorial. So the number of arrangements is three choose three times three factorial, which equals one times six, which equals six. Next, we look at if there's one A. Now, if there's one A, that means that we we, we need two other letters. So from the three non-A's, we choose two. So three choose two. And now in this situation, we still have three different letters because we have one A and then the other letters from the non-A's, which are all different. So we have three different letters. So once again, the permutation is three factorial. So the number of arrangements is three choose two times three factorial, which equals three times six, which equals 18. Next, if we have two A's, now there's only one other letter that we need from the non-A's, so that's three choose one. And now the permutation for that is we have a three letter string, but two of the letters are the same, the two A's. So, so that's three factorial over two factorial. So now our number of arrangements is three choose one times three factorial over two factorial, which equals three times three, which equals nine. And finally, if we have three A's, in other words, if, we, if the entire three-letter string is made up of the three A's, then we're choosing none from the three non-A's, so that's three choose zero. And now we have three letters that are all identical, so that's just three factorial over three factorial. That's the permutation for that. In other words, three choose zero times three factorial 
over 3 factorial, which works out to 1 times 1, which equals 1. So the final answer to this problem, the total number of three-letter words or strings, is equal to 6 plus 8 plus 9 plus 1, which equals 34. Question 6. In how many different ways can four pairs of shoes be placed along a shoe rack if, and we have three situations, A, there are no restrictions, B, each matching pair of shoes must be adjacent to each other, and C, we're asked to redo part B, but instead for a round table. So we start with A. Now, if there's no restrictions here, then what we really have are just four times two, because there's two shoes in each pair, which equals eight shoes to simply arrange in a row. And that's just a permutation of eight objects all taken. In other words, eight P8 or eight permute eight, which equals eight factorial, which equals 40,320. For part B, in this case, each pair of shoes must be together. So the way to figure out the number of ways they can be arranged is as follows. First, we treat each pair as a unit. So we are essentially arranging the pairs of shoes, and there's four of them. So that's just 4P4, which equals four factorial ways to arrange the pairs of shoes as units kept together. But that's not all. We also what we also need to then do is we need to consider the fact that within each of the four pairs, the left and right shoes can be further arranged. They can either be you know, going from left to right. It could be the left and then the right, or it could be the right and then the left. In other words, we can arrange the pair of shoes, because there's two of them in the pair, in 2P2 or two factorial ways. And we have to keep in mind that this is happening four times. So the final answer to this question is four factorial. That's the number of ways of arranging the pairs amongst themselves. And then we multiply it by two factorial raised to the power of four because of the fact that there's four, four pairs of shoes. And that gives us 24 times 16, which equals 384. For part C, we approach the problem in the same way, except with the difference that we discussed earlier when we're arranging things uh, in a circle instead of in a, in, a, in a sort of a line that has a beginning and an end. So the way we model this problem is as follows. First, again, we consider each pair to be a unit, and there's four of these. So we figure out the number of ways of arranging the pairs in a circle. And remembering that the formula for arranging objects in a circle, if there's n of them, the number of arrangements is n minus 1 factorial. That must mean that there's 4 minus 1 factorial, or 3 factorial ways to arrange the pairs of shoes. And then all we do to finish the problem is the same thing we did in part b. For each of these circular arrangements, we can still have two factorial arrangements within each pair. And of course, there's four of these. So that gives us our final answer of three factorial times two factorial to the four, which equals six times 16, which equals 96. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from MRSA Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.